This episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is brought to you in part by the National Hemp Association. The National Hemp Association is a nonprofit organization committed to the growth and development of all aspects of the hemp industry. Learn how the National Hemp Association can help your hemp operation. Become a member today at nationalhempassociation.org. National Hemp Association. Pushing progress. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and today we talk to Alan Wagner, a greenhouse grower from Altoona, Pennsylvania, where he's been in the greenhouse business for over 40 years. Wholesale, retail, geraniums, garden plants of all kinds. But the box stores moved in, and they were just about to put him out of business when the 2018 Farm Bill was signed into law and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture lifted the acreage cap and opened up the permitting process, and Alan Wagner decided to go all in on industrial hemp. Good morning and welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself for us? Yes, I'm uh, Alan Wagner. Uh, I own Wagner's Greenhouses in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been a grower for 45 years of annuals and presentation plants, and I'm now growing hemp exclusively. Wow. Okay. Um, So give us a sense of your your background in horticulture. Uh, How'd you get your start? What was your business like over the years? I actually fell into the business. I bought a house that had greenhouses that needed to be torn down and had to heat for a period of time, had to heat the greenhouses. So I put some plants in, ended up selling those plants and I was in business. 15, 20 years later, I bought a much larger range. The original range was about 3000 square feet. Okay. I bought a 33,000 square foot range on across town from me that had been in business since 1889. Whoa. Okay. One family-owned business until then, and I've owned it for 32 years now. And business was good? Business was good. Uh, until they started, the, the box stores started springing up everywhere. Mm. And then we started going head-to-head with them retail. Um, we got out of wholesale because it started getting highly competitive. Uh, with the 20 and 30 acre ranges, you just could not compete on a price basis. Right. And we went uh, 100, about 15 years ago, went 100% retail. And that was very good until they started building Walmarts and Home Depots and Lowe's and right. and all those other outlets. And then the, the large box stores, we were able to get into our market share. And we ended up just not having quite as much fun as we used to. Right. And then what, were you about to close the, the greenhouse or what happened? We were very, I, I'm 69 years old and um, got a knee replacement last year. My wife had a hip replacement and, and it got to be very physical. It's a physical occupation. Mm-hmm. Greenhouses is a lot of work. Anyone in the business realizes it's the only thing I think is worse is a dairy farmer works harder right <laughs> you've right. got a lot of stuff to take care of sure and uh it was just getting too much the 14 hour retail days the uh winter heating i was coal heating um that's a very physical occupation just running the boilers and stuff so we pretty well had decided that that it was about time to retire from the the greenhouse business and then we talked to a extension agent anyway tom ford uh he's in this area and and asked him how the hemp was going he said that 2018 was was just a horrible year to grow hemp because of how wet the season was Mm -hmm. uh germination was poor and he thought there might be a little niche area not a big one because we've only had 50 growers um this year, there would they only plan on 50 growers this year, but I was going to try to pick up customers, germinate seedlings for them so that they had plants to put in the ground as opposed to just bare seed. Well, so he he suggested that you get into that niche market. 
he said that there would be a he sees a market there now okay. whether he knew me i've known the man for years yeah and um we've always tried we've worked with the extension we've worked with penn state as far as testing certain herbicides and and fungicides um we have the out to campus within a quarter mile of our location okay so if they were working on a project they would sometimes come over and use us as a, a test dummy so to speak <laughs> and he thought I might be interested in doing it. It's something new. Um, no one else seemed to be in it. Right. So, and he, he, over the years, he saw me getting older and knew that I was right. not long for the, the annual uh, flower trade. And then, so what did you think? Were, were you like, no, that's crazy. I don't want to grow hemp. Or what was your thought process? Three years ago, I looked into the medical marijuana, mm-hmm. but it just became... How do I want to, way too difficult to get a permit. Okay. So I grew annuals for a couple of years and then I met him. I'm trying to figure out how to make this place work better on less hours. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like a good fit. I'm, you know, I've been germinating, I've been germinating seeds for 45 years. Um, taking cuttings. I've taken millions of cuttings of geraniums. I've propagated for some of the largest geranium companies in the world. Right. And it seemed like a good fit for my talent. Right. And then, and then President Trump signed the, the farm bill. Right. And when that happened, the potential exploded. Sure. So it, it became large enough that I could um, see that it, I could make a profitable business, uh, a profit at less, at less time. Was there any like stigma, like a marijuana pot stigma that you had to get over, like in your own mind before you got into this? I had gotten over that with the medical marijuana. Okay. I'm a, well, obviously 69 years old. I went through the the uh, reefer madness years and all the bad war on drug years. Yeah. And frankly, probably four to five years ago, whenever they started this medical marijuana thing, I was very dubious. Yeah. But then I started looking into it. <laughs> And found out that that what I had learned in my younger years, my more informative years, was pretty much wrong. Hmm. And now that I'm look, I started looking into the hemp and the CBDs, and and talked to a lot of people that are using both both medical marijuana and CB, high CBD, mm-hmm. and I believe them. Sure, I believe them a lot more than I believe our government anymore. They actually seem, I've seen it work. I've seen medic marijuana work on Parkinson's people, going from not being able to pick up a glass of water without shaking half of it out right. to be able to pick it up and drink it like uh, like I would, yeah. just like a person that had no problems. Right. So I, I'm now a believer. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer that I'm not just doing something for the money, as that it also helps people. Right. I mean, I got to make a profit. I'm a businessman. There's that's part of the formula. And everybody liked our plants before. That was the biggest thing, giving up our customers. Right. Because we developed friendships over the fo- last 45 years. I bet. But it was a necessary evil. So can you describe what your greenhouses look like now? Right now, the greenhouses, well, parts of them are very green with hemp. Um, we had a rough winter. First, we had in January, we had a, a major pipeline a water line break at the top of the hill from us and we were at the bottom of the hill so we, we got flooded Uh-oh. and in in march we had two greenhouses collapse from uh um a high wind i don't know what exactly came through this valley but it was high enough it it uh, destroyed two of my greenhouses oh wow so it looks like an old greenhouse range that's starting to fall down at the moment it it will be all fixed up again but it's just a, a, a 33 square foot of um, combined double poly, uh, polycarbonate, and glass. Okay. Built in the 20s. Most of it was built in the, in the 20s. And so when did you, uh, where did you source your seeds from? When did you start um, propagating them? Talk us through that. I got my permit right around the 1st of March and found out that the hemp and marijuana industry, the cannabis, let's say the cannabis industry is not a normal horticultural industry. (laughs) What do you mean by that? Well, I mean by that, uh, there's a lot of people that would not sell me seeds to germinate and then sell to another customer because they were afraid of their genetics getting out. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
with a geranium, you, you get a license to propagate it and you can sell it to anybody you want. It was very difficult to get that, uh, I guess it's a material transfer agreement hmm. that would allow me to do anything. Right. It wouldn't allow me to take cuttings. It would not allow me to do what I had planned to do. No one would let me do it. Bring up seeds, sell seedlings, take cuttings and sell cuttings. Right. I found a gentleman in Cal Colorado, though, called Colorado Seed Solutions. Um, I believe his last name's McBaney, who agreed to sell me the seed. And because of the quantity I bought, um, agreed to also let me reproduce it. It essentially gave me the genetics as far as reproduction, resale, uh, cuttings, seed production. He gave me all those rights. Okay. So, and I guess there's a few other companies that do the same thing. I just couldn't find them. Most of the companies I was talking to, I tried to talk royalty deal with them for cuttings, you know, and there was no hearing of it. Hmm. Now, the, the, the problem they're going to have is I've been in the general, I've been in the general agricultural now for 45 years. Sure. Growing licensed varieties, genetics that are actually patented. And if, a company came out with a brand new product this year. Two years from now, there was that product was sitting in greenhouses as, as gypsy plants. Hmm. They would get out. Right. Your MTA agreements really only as valuable as the two pe the honesty of the two people that agree. Right. So, a royalty helps control that a little bit, but eventually, you know, I would have greenhouse owners come into my greenhouse buy some of my product and the next year they'd be selling it without any name, but they'd be selling that product. Right. And you knew it was the same, same plant. Yeah. I could not prove it unless I did genetics on it, but I, I knew what was going on. Essentially I knew what was going on. All right. So you have, you have your seeds from, uh, this, the guy from Colorado, you got them, you said you got your permit in first of March. And right went... around the first to third, fourth, in the, the first week of March, I got the permit. Okay. Found a guy in Colorado who sent me seed. And April 1st, I started put, dropping seeds. Okay. I'm not sure whether I had, it's my problem or it was a seeds problem, but I got a lower germination than I anticipated. Oh. So I brought in some more seed. From the same guy? Same guy. Okay. But actually, he, he replaced quite a bit of the seeds of the original order. Oh, okay. He, he did a real, a, a fairest guy I ever dealt with, hmm. really. He just, on my word, he sent me, you know, a, a five pounds of seed. Wow, okay. So, and I am then dropped those. But the first group, I finished transplanting, oh, I don't have my records here, about a, right around uh, the uh, 22nd, 23rd of April. The things grow, I hate to use this, it's a joke <laughs> around here, but they do grow like a weed. Right. Um, you know, it's poor, I have a germination chamber, um, a cedar, a Blackmore turbo cedar that'll drop. I can plant 40,000 seeds a day without a big problem. Wow. I uh, have a germination chamber that holds that many. Two days later, I pull them out. They're germinated. Put them on the bed, let them go for 10 to 12 days and start transplanting them. All right. I've got plants now. Right now, the first group ranges from about six inches to 12. Okay. Now, did you have did you have any sense of what your market was going to be before you... You bought the seeds? Mm, no. So you were just jumping in, taking a risk? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And the second group of seeds I brought in that he sent some extras in with was strictly um, speculation. Yeah. I only, only because last year there was supposed to be 50 growers. This year. Yeah. The, the PDA announced in June or something that they would select 50 research growers. So if you were a seedsman growing for Pennsylvania, and you looked at Pennsylvania for the hemp seed, it was limited to 100 acres and 50 growers. Well, right. logic tells me I would not put, I'd put in seed enough for that mm -hmm. maximum amount, 5,000 5, acres 000. max. All of a sudden, there's going to be over five. I've talked to 451 already. I talked to a, a permit number 451. Wow. So I'm expecting over five. That was a week ago before the deadline even. So I'm expecting over 500, there's going to be a shortage of, of both seeds and plant. And, and that's already coming to fruition. Hmm. That's why I brought the extra seeds in on speculation, because it seemed like a pretty fair deal. Yeah. Once they removed that acreage cap, you know, it was like wide open for business. And I, I thought the state did a really good job 
and they're being smart about it. I'm not a f- real fan because of the way the marijuana, the medical marijuana was done. I wasn't a big fan of Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Now, that was the he- health department did that, not the ag department. Right. But the ag department doing what they did was one of the m- best things I've seen government do for years. Unlimited acreage, unlimited growers. Now, they did put a deadline, but the deadline of May 1st actually makes sense because it's about a four-week process right. to get your permit. So people could still get their seeds in the ground by the 1st of June mm-hmm. if they can get seed. I understand there's seed out there. Um, some of it expensive and some of it even more expensive. Now, did you buy feminized seed or are you culling the males or what do you... Because you said you're growing for CBD, right? I'm growing for, yes, high CBD. Mm-hmm. Uh, initially thought I was going to be able to sex the plants and then move them around, take the males out, fill the holes with females, right. and sell a flat of feminized. Or sell a, sex of, yeah. uh, a, a flat of female seeds with maybe one or two males in it. And how's that working out? Not well. So right now I'm just, I, I lowered my prices and I'm just selling the flats. Okay. You buy 70, I, there are 72 flat, I'm selling them as 70s. Um, the extra two plants are for breakage and shipment or things like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, I sell a flat and unfortunately the farmer's going to have to either uh, sex it before putting it in the field, which can be done. Right. I've been told it can be done. I haven't done this yet or I'd have feminized flax. Right. Uh, but I don't have time to draw black cloth for 10 days, but um, I've been told by two or three people, one a doctoral of Penn State University that runs the program now Mm -hmm. for the university, um, has told me that if you put, give them a short day treatment for 10 days, maybe 12, that you can then sex your plants before you put them in the field. Okay. So my suggestion to any farmer that has a couple flatbed trailers or, you know, harvest, uh, so well, the, yeah, just the flatbed uh, carts that they drag behind and throw the throw the hay bales on or whatever. Oh, right. Yep. Lay their plants on those. They can water the plants and back it back your trailer, back your cart into a barn that's dark at night. Right. Or even during the day, you know, a garage cover the windows up, do whatever you need to do to make it dark. Back it in there, bring it out during the day, so you get good sunlight on it during the day. Give it less than twelve hours for ten days, and they. Mm-hmm probably will be able to sex them before they put them in the field. Okay. Otherwise, they're going to have to tend to their field. Sure. And they're going to, no matter what they buy, I don't care whether you're buying guaranteed female cuttings or whether you're buying feminized seed, you are going to have to walk your field. Absolutely. Yeah. Because of the, the plant's ability to, split itself down the middle and produce male spur male spores in case there are no males. Right. So it's you're going to have to find that plant, the morphing. Right. The hermaphrodites. Yep. So no matter why, whether you're looking for one or, or, or in my case, maybe 20 per flat, you're still walking your fields. Sure. I think any, any good farmer would be doing that anyway. Right. If they're aware of doing that. Yeah. I, I've heard nightmare stories of the previous couple of years where some growers didn't even know there was such a thing as male and female hemp plants. He shouldn't have been in the business yet if he didn't know that, but that happened. Right. You really just got to educate yourself. Well, we have to educate each other. Right. I've been trying to get a location map from the state of Pennsylvania for, well, since about the 1st of February. They were supposed to put it out the 1st of February. Of the grower locations. Locations of all the permit holders. Mm-hmm. Then they were going to put it out the end of March. Now they're going to put it out when all the permits are given out. The obvious problem to me is I'm sending in for a permit. I don't know what the existing grower in my area is going to grow. Right. Yep. And That's... if he's going to grow CBD and I'm going to grow gr- uh, grain or uh, fiber, I'm mm-hmm. going to have a lot of males. Yep. You're going to have some problems. Or he's going to, the CBD grower is going to have some problems for sure. Well, the CBD grower, though, if he's the existing grower, it, it, according to what I'm reading in the state regulations, it's whoever's there first within a three-mile radius. When I brought this up to a couple people, 
I was told that even a medical, if, if, if I have a permit, I'm the existing grower, mm-hmm. and a medical marijuana ca- grower cannot locate. And those guys have a lot of money in that location. Right. But if I'm the existing grower and they come in after I'm, I'm on my permit date, I could have them by the, 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 uh, by the throat. Yeah, right. The state is not issuing this map is going to create huge problems. Yeah, I've heard similar concerns from other growers. Um, and it could potentially pit farmer against farmer, which that's not a good way to operate. No, your neighbors. You're some, yeah. even, if, even though you may be three mile radius away, you're still neighbors. Yeah. You know, I see, I, I foresee things like there may be growers in, in Lancaster County that are growing a thousand acres of, of uh, fiber. Right. And there's a quarter acre guy who got his permit first growing CBD. That thousand, that fifteen hundred acres or thousand acres is is dead. They might as well start planting corn now. So yeah, I a... see things like that happening because the state wasn't willing to put out a a a, a, a live a live map that they could put a, a new location on. Whenever they approved a permit, they could go over and pinpoint that new location. So I see that as being a problem in the industry that will be ironed out. But once again. It could pit farmer against farmer, and you got that poor dairy farmer that, quote unquote, trying to save the farm with an acre or two of, of hemp. He ends up getting sued and losing the farm to that. Yeah, it could get ugly. Hopefully, it won't. But yeah, there's going to have to be some guidance from the state, and you know they they have to issue some, probably some regulation on this just to protect, protect the farmer's interests. Yes. Now I've already I've got a couple of people within my zone, but they're growing CBD also, so I don't care. Okay. I'll go over and walk their fields to make sure they don't have any males, just so I don't get pollinated. Sure. And hopefully they may do the same for me. So how many hemp plants does Alan Wagner have in the greenhouses? We'll find out after this break. Okay. So let's say that you're just about to plant an acre, two acres, 10 acres of high CBD hemp, right? You just spent a lot of money on seed or seedlings and those plants are going in the ground and you're hoping for the best. You're hoping to make a decent amount of money on the other side of this, right? But you know, it's a risk. You know, there's no guarantees in farming. And then you think, well, what about deer? I bet deer could do some damage, but you don't want to find out. You know, this is one of those preventable risks. So I was talking to a hemp farmer in the southern tier of New York, a guy by the name of Roy Willis. And he got into growing hemp for pretty much one reason. Money. And he didn't want a bunch of deer taking a bite out of his investment. We're growing hemp for CBD oil, and we uh, currently using 15 acres. 15 acres. I got the deer busters online, you know, basically Google deer fence and came up with them, and I'm very happy that I did. Yeah, because the deer aren't going to eat his hemp. Deer Buster's prices were right in line with what's out there, but the biggest thing was their customer service was excellent. DeerBusters.com. If you're growing hemp in a place where you know there's deer pressure, you owe it to yourself to check out DeerBusters.com. They sell quality, affordable, easy to install mesh deer fences because CBD doesn't stand for chewed by deer. Okay, welcome back. We're here with Alan Wagner from Wagner's Greenhouses in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Alan, how much hemp are you growing? Uh, the first crop came out to about 100,000. Uh, the second crop looks like it's going to be closer to 200,000. Wow. Um, they will, well, the second crop is, is for June 1st on. Uh, the first, the speculative crop was, was put in a little later only because of the I didn't see what was happening until it happened. Right. So um, I wish I could have got it in a week early, but it should be ready for, for going out of here between the 1st and 15th of June. And frankly, there may be quite a few new permit holders at that time. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be looking for plants or seeds. Um, and frankly, even though I may have put them in only the 1st of May, they've still got four weeks on any seed that's put on, on June 1st. Sure. And since all this stuff blooms the same time, it it comes down to how long your plant's been from seed till it sets bud. So you get, you know, 
you buy a seedling, put it in June 1st, you get four extra weeks of growing in that warm, nice, warm summer, sure. long day summer. Right. So that's where I, I foresee in the future I add value to the whole thing, especially in Pennsylvania. In North Carolina, different situation. Florida, Arizona, Arizona thinks they can grow year-round, at least fiber, right. uh, where you don't have to trigger a bloom. But in Pennsylvania, probably 60% of the state, you, cannot plant, you really shouldn't plant before the 1st of June. Right. So I see the industry in the future going to seedlings and rooted cuttings or clones. I, for 45 years, I've called them rooted cuttings. It's hard to get me shifted over to clones. <laughs> but um, I see that the way the, in, the industry going that direction, that uh, you take cuttings from plants on the, in the field this year. When that plant is harvested, you will have the exact CBD, THC, all the other uh, cannabinoids in, that are in that plant. Right. And you'll be able to just keep re- reproducing that plant. So do you um, have a certain expectation of your CBD percentage in, uh, in your variety here? It's right around the, the, the uh, COA, which is a certificate of analysis, indicates it's right around 13.5. And uh, does the state have, have you testing a lot there or you, you don't have to do any testing until it's in the field? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, actually, if you uh, even, I'm not sure if I can say marijuana, but most all hemp at this stage of growth, very little uh, CBD has been generated right. or THC or anything else. So testing at this point would uh, just sort of, of be a waste of money. Um, are you getting a, a big response from, from growers? I've started. Um, actually, what started, the earlier permit, People seem to already get, they got their permits in April. So they, they were able to line up seeds and, and uh, plants at that time. Mm-hmm. But demand is growing dramatically. There, the other states have permitted tremendous. Uh, Illinois, I think, just passed the law a couple of weeks ago, and they've already got 500 permits. All coming up on that June 1 planting date. Yeah, and, right. Um, so I see it a real demand building towards the end of this month. Um, once again, that's why I took the speculative move. Yeah. Um, my initial crop of 100,000 are, I would say close to 60 or 70% sold right now. And this weekend they could almost all be gone or after this, after this podcast airs, they, they could all be gone. Are you able to sell out of state? Yes. Good. Uh, okay. There's different paperwork. Mm-hmm. Um, to do that, but as I understand from the folks in Harrisburg, uh, if I have the right paperwork, I can sell out a state. Okay. Now the problem, <laughs> the problem comes down to whether I can transport it out of state. Mm. Uh, the federal law requires there be a federal transport permit, which I don't know if it even exists at this point. Right. You have to have, as I understand it, you got to have. Uh, uh, a permit from the state that's receiving and the state that's shipping. And right now, shipping, in my mind, is out of the question. I want to stay in Pennsylvania Okay. for this year. Right. Once they get, I mean, there's guys who got arrested driving through Illinois, I guess. Yeah, I heard about that. Because it was still illegal in Illinois to transport it anywhere where on either state, on either side, it was legal. Right. So, you know, the feds haven't caught up. This industry is a steamroller that has already leveled the playing field and the regulators got rolled over somewhere in the back. And I understand it's not a quick thing to regulate stuff, but the industry essentially is way ahead of the regulation at this point, which is good and bad. (laughs) It allows some people into the industry that probably should not be in it. How can you verify that the person you're selling to is a permit holder? I take a copy of his permit. Oh, okay. I, I, I need a copy of his permit. I re, this is what I require personally. I don't know what the state requires me to take. And I just inquired recently about on exactly what document. I just started selling, so I have time yet. I've got a lot of orders, but not have not actually completed the deal. I've okay. got down payments. Right. Some of my customers have not received their permit yet. Uh, 
and they just call up and say, hey, you know, here's here's a deposit, hold the plants for me. So since there's no, I'm not given a plant doesn't leave this property without me seeing the person permit right. in hand, and then we need the driver's license and all that to make sure he's who he says he is or yep. she. Yep. And at that point, I will keep a copy of their permit as part of whatever I I have to take in. Are you also going to be growing in the field this year? I will. I'm planning to grow about two acres. Okay. I'm not necessarily growing to harvest. I'm just growing to learn. Okay. It's it's tough whenever people call me up about buying plants and then say, well, you know, what do I do with them whenever I would leave <laughs> your greenhouse? Because I've never grown the crop. It's difficult. I can only relate what I've read and talked to other people about. Right. Um, so I'm going to grow some uh um, like I said, about two acres, and maybe it'll only be one, um, just to learn how to grow the thing. That's commendable. Yeah, you got to educate yourself. I hate to say there's. It seems like there's some people in this business to make their money this year and next, mm-hmm. and then retire. Uh, I'm looking at it on a long, more long-term basis. I know I'm elderly, but I have some heirs that may take over the the business, and I'd like to leave them. A, a stable industry, so to speak. Right. The, the folks that are in this this year are actually, you know, they're like the, the frontiersmen. We're right. we're working on a brand new industry here in the yeah. United States. You're pioneers. Something that hasn't been done for a long, long time. There's going to be mistakes made. There's a learning curve involved. But I think in the long run, it's going to be a nice, stable industry, especially, uh, well, it's going to be a stable industry because of all the uses of hemp. Right. Right now, the CBD is the money. But there's going to be a supply and demand, all of that economic stuff going on. And eventually you'll make a good living with CBD, but you won't be able to retire in two years. At least uh, that's what I foresee. I foresee a lot of these prices. Some of these $10 plants are not going to be $10 ever again. Right. Yeah, it's going to have to come down. Um, is that what you're selling your plants for? Oh, my God, no. <laughs> What are your prices like? Uh, my prices are, uh, depending on quantity, you can buy them for 80 cents a piece. Oh, okay. Now, what's the average order? What are you, what are you seeing from these growers? Well, I can, let me give you a range rather than an average. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing one to three acres. Okay. I'm seeing between 20, you know, 21, 2200 plants up to six and 7,000. Okay. Which works out to about 2,000, 2,100 plants per acre. Um, do you have a sense of where they're going? Or are a lot of the farmers coming from, from a certain area, or are they spread throughout no. the state? I'm, I'm averaging, I'm, you know, statewide, I'm uh, as far north as Erie, Lancaster County, of course, mm-hmm. uh, south almost to the Virginia border, or West Virginia border, that border down there, right. <laughs> Maryland. Um, yeah. I'm seeing just sort of a sprinkling across the the uh, the state. Now, how are people finding you? Is it all online, or how are you getting your message out? Well, I it started out I I was languishing for a while. Let me put it that way, because I I wanted the reason I wanted the the, the state map was to get customers. Mm-hmm. I wanted the mailing list. I did mail out to the research people last year, but that was only thirty people. So I was after the state as much to get a mailing list as I was to find out where the growers were. Right. And then the local newspaper picked on up that I was doing this. Was that the Altoona Mirror? The Altoona Mirror, yeah. Yeah, that's where I saw you. There you go. And then a couple other people saw that and started generating interest that way. And then a friend of mine put me on Craigslist the other day. Okay. And that has really helped quite a bit. And once again, I hope your podcast, you know, helps me along. If you want to put something out for information, just, you know, use the phone number or the, uh, the, uh, the email address, email address, excuse me. Yeah. All right. So I have that as a L a R one five at AOL.com. Yes. And, uh, people can reach the greenhouse at eight, one, four, nine, four, six, zero, seven, eight, eight. Yes. All right, Alan Wagner from Wagner's Greenhouses in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Okay, that does it for me. My name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. You can reach me at podcast at lancasterfarming.com. 
You can subscribe to Lancaster Farming Newspaper at lancasterfarming.com slash podcast deal. Also, be sure to subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts, because I'm taking a couple weeks off and the show won't be back until the first week of June. If you're going to the Cannabis World Congress and Business Expo in New York City at the end of this month, maybe I'll see you there. But in the meantime, I'll see you in the newspaper. Episode 35 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2019 by Lancaster Farming. Lancaster Farming is a member of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by yours truly, Eric Harlock. Any music you hear is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. Industrial hemp. Industrial hemp. Industrial hemp. Industrial hemp.